Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with a very interesting disc by Venezuelan composer um, Ivencio Castellanos. He lived from, let's say, 1915 to 1984, so he had a reasonably, a reasonably decent life, and he wrote some really lovely music in the Romantic nationalist vein. Now, I have to confess, I am a sucker for romantic nationalist Latin American music, unless it's like completely and totally incompetent, which some of it is, but a lot of it isn't, and this is an isn't. He really knew what he was doing. He was a very important figure in the history and evolution of Venezuelan music. And here I want to digress for a minute before we get back to this and talk a little bit about how music history operates. Music history, as I've said a million times, is winner's history. It's the story told by the folks who think that what they did is most important. And it's a, a largely a story of who did what first. So, so when certain countries, which didn't have a big classical music tradition until, for example, the 20th century, like England, <laughs> for example, or others of that type, United States, you know, they had their romantic nationalist moments, that is the use of folk songs and, and indigenous rhythms and, 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 and forms and modes and dances and stuff and songs and the idea to create a unique national sound. That happens whenever it happens. If you look at normal music history, you know, the way she's taught in the public schools, you know, then what happens is you have you have the Baroque period, the classical period, the Romantic period. And in the Romantic period, which was a time of nation building and, and you know, internationalist fervor in Europe only, and only in a part of Europe, in Western Europe, pretty specifically Western Europe and, and the empires, the Austro-Hungarian Empire and whatnot, and Russia, you know, and whatnot. But, but if you look at if you look at what history tells us, then that folk romantic nationalist thing happened in the middle to late 19th century, mostly, and then it died. And then you had, you know, chromaticism and impressionism and Schoenberg and Berg and Weber and atonality and music history moved on. But in reality, in reality, those things, those evolutionary moments happened at different times, in different places, in different countries, depending on their musical infrastructure. It's really that simple. And on the rise of conservatories and training and, and evolution of native composers who were interested in indigenous or local music. So it happened at a different time in every place. And no one story is, is more correct than any other story. We are just raised to listen to the, the German romantic historical story and to treat it as the history of all music, all Western music. And nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be more incorrect or more wrong. So Latin America um, was colonialized by Western Europe and it it took its culture, as the United States did, from European norms and European formal examples. And the colonizers, who became the, the aristocratic class in most of those countries, um, founded symphony orchestras and a certain musical cultural infrastructure, as I mentioned before, about infrastructure. And so it took them time, and it wasn't really until the late 19th, very late 19th, and early 20th century, early 20th centuries, that that infrastructure had its romantic nationalist mo moment. Curiously, many of these countries had their Baroque moments, because that's when, you know, the conquistadors first showed up. And remember, there was a whole thing about, you know, Baroque music composed by Mexican composers and Latin American composers. It was very interesting. It really was for the missions and the churches and the liturgical the liturgical world. That was also another aspect of this this process. But the the ability to write romantic nationalist symphonic music required a tradition of symphonic performance, which meant symphony orchestras, which meant conservatories, which meant trained musicians who could run around and do all of this stuff. 
You know, you might recall, for example, that Toscanini got his big break conducting Aida in Argentina because there was a big operatic tradition in Argentina at the at the end of the 19th century, but a symphonic performance tradition, not so much. And so those countries had to wait until they had what they needed to have in order to do the romantic nationalist thing. And I always think it's I always think it's so interesting because because we tend to we tend to take this this sort of Germanic tiny niche historical story as if it has some kind of wider relevance. And it doesn't. It doesn't have any relevance at all. It doesn't tell you whether there isn't good music written elsewhere. And it certainly doesn't tell you that romantic nationalist music that's written in the 20th century, sometimes even the late 20th century, is somehow bad or re regressive or, 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 you know, none of that's true. <laughs> it's just based on a warped telling of history. So I've raved about that and ranted about that often and often and often because I was trained as an actual real historian and, and you know, and music history is not really history, frankly, in many respects. It's just a list of things that certain people valued above other things. And whether that matters or not depends on what those other things are, whether you care, but it's not, it's not truth. So that's a long way of saying that Venezuela's romantic nationalist moment was a mid 20th century phenomenon. Um, it really was. Brazil's was a little older. You had Villa Lobos in the first decades of the 20th century who was doing stuff. I mean, every country had its thing um, and its time. So this was the time. And we have on this lovely disc featuring the Orquesta Sinfonica de Venezuela, conducted by Jan Wagner, um, who is Venezuelan, by the way. Uh, the following, the following works. Uh, the tone poem, Santa Cruz de Pacarigua. Santa Cruz de Pacarigua is a church um, built outside of Caracas. It was composed in 1954. It's a big, beautiful 17-minute tone poem full of all the stuff you want in this music. You know, exotic coloration, wonderful, vibrant melodies, and, and bracing dance rhythms. It's just terrific stuff. And then we've got El Rio de las Siete Estrellas, the Rio of the Seven Stars, which I believe is the Orinoco River, I think. Um, and that was composed in 1946. And then finally, the Suite Avilenia. And the Suite Avilenia has one, two, three, four, five different uh, movements. They're marked Avilenia, La Ronda de Niños, the, the round gaming games of children, the Nocturne, then Dawn on Christmas Day, and finally Christmas which is a fiesta festival. It's just a beautiful, beautiful set of orchestral pieces um, based on Venezuelan folklore and, and history. And uh, the guy knew what he was doing, Castellanos. He really did. It's a fun disc. I, I don't expect we're going to hear too much more of this, so you've got to enjoy it while you can get it. And here it is on Naxos, again with the Orchestra Sinfonica de Venezuela under Jan Wagner really, really enjoyable music. So for those of you who are looking for a change of pace, something exotic, something to trip up your friends by asking them who wrote it, try this disc. I have a feeling you'll find it extremely entrancing, as I did. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.